<laughs> For you, it's free. <laughs> You're 30 seconds closer to Wheaton Surprise Sale Thursday. Coming up next, Webster. Good morning. Mondays are not my favorite broadcast days for obvious reasons. And least of all this morning, because there's one guy missing, Dr. Doug Kenny from UBC. I'm going to attempt to whip up some interest in the cuts in university funding. And later in the program, we're going to talk to Dr. John Gossage from the Royal Columbian, who is going to give me some views, you might say part four of my series on the shameful inaction and neglect in the treatment of children with diseases of the mind and severe emotional problems often connected with delinquency. That's John Gossage. In the studio this morning, not for right light relief but deadly serious, is Pat McGear, the minister in charge of universities as well as something called science and communications. But first off the top, is George Peterson. Poor George couldn't come in his track suit this morning because they're cutting back on track and field and football at SFU. We want to find out if he's got a valid case to scream about a piddling million and a half dollars of which he is short, you know, and find out how many redundant courses and how much waste of money there might be at Simon Fraser University. And we'll start with George Peterson after the break. Simon Fraser University has got 13,000 students, equal to about 9,500 full-time students. Budget of $70 million, and it's been slashed by a million and a half by the provincial government. And here this morning is George Peterson, the president of Simon Fraser University. Doesn't seem that bad. Can you get by in these times of stricture and exploding costs in all other ministries with a mere million and a half cut from your budget? Well, I don't know if you've ever gone through the exercise, Jack, of trying to cut a million and a half out of a $70 million budget. No, I haven't. Better, better believe that it is not the most pleasant exercise to go through. I should, before we go on, correct something you said. Uh, <coughs> provincial government has not cut our budget by a million and a half. What we have found is that we have expenditures that have shown up during the course of this year that must be built into our base budget for next fiscal year, and they are in the amount of a million and a half. Some of those come about as a result of salary increases. Some of them come about as a result of a shortfall in the grant that we got from the University's Council at the beginning of the year. Other factors such as postage increases and so on make up that million but and a half. But the only place dollars. you're going to get that million and a half which you need is from the provincial government one way or another. Well, universities typically in Canada only have two sources. One is the government and the other uh, is whatever is brought in in the way of student tuition fees. So those are the two principal sources of funding in Canada unlike what is done in some other parts of the world. And are you telling me you're a million and a half short to, st to stand still? We are a million and a half short to stand still going into next year's fiscal year, 1982-83. All right, let's get the fees out of the way uh, right off the bat. How, can you tell me how cheap it is to go to SFU and if you've been lax in recommending fee increases as people's wages have gone up and up and up? Well, if, if the point you're making is that fees have not kept pace with inflation or with the grants, that is in fact correct. Uh, however, you're also probably aware that politically that's a difficult kind of thing to get through any university and for a number of years Simon Fraser University had no tuition fee increases at all and I think the same was true at the other two universities. The fees are relatively common across the three institutions. Are they too cheap? 
Well, that's, that's a straight value judgment you're asking me to make. We can go all the way from a British or an Australian system where there's no tuition fee at all, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, entry is relatively restricted, to the fees that one has to pay at, at Harvard at the present time, which are of the order of $7,000 for three quarters. So, you know, th that is strictly a matter of policy as to what a particular political constituency thinks is appropriate. Mind you, in times of desperate need, you might consider putting the fees up. Have you put them up this year? They've already gone up 23 percent, and we have a proposal before our board now to have consideration given to differential fees for foreign students. Undoubtedly, that will be a controversial issue. Now, 23 percent, can you give me an average of, of the fee structure? I don't want to belabor it, but I'd like to know. Well, ours are relatively common because we have very few of the large professional schools such as UBC. At the present time, it's $330 per semester, and a typical student load would be two semesters out of the three per year, so $660. The increase that's proposed or that's already passed, as a matter of fact, is, is moving that to $810. Uh, up to $810. Of your students, and I said, what, 9,500 equivalent full-time, right? Yes. 13,000 headcount. Yes, we have a very large complement of part-time students at SFU. How many of them are non-residents of um, Canada? On the, at the undergraduate level, about 10 percent, roughly 1,100 students. They should pay more than the locals, shouldn't they? Well, there are, there are clearly two points of view. I have recommended that there be a differential fee. But I should tell you that philosophically, I don't agree with that. I think there are good, strong arguments for having international students at a university. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all here. No, no, I don't I have there, to. If I you've only got 10 percent, it's not too bad. No, you, that's you, relatively high for a Canadian university. It is, is it? Yes. You don't deny a, a, any residence entry because of that 10 percent, do you? We typically don't deny entry, but what is starting to appear now is we are getting high demand in certain areas such as computing science, business administration where entry is going to be restricted on the basis of, of performance, on the basis of grade point. So it may well be that someone would want to argue that uh, because an international student got in due to a higher grade point, someone else was restricted who was a national. Yeah, it doesn't seem quite fair. In some ways, if you've got a preponderance of non-Canadian students in some of your faculties. Right. But you don't have. We have a preponderance of our foreign students in certain departments. Computer science. Yes. Those are the Commerce. High, those are the high demand areas on the part of everybody. That's almost universal these days. All right, now, is there any prospect of you getting this million and a half additional you need? Well, we've already approached the government for an additional uh, uh, level of assistance of the order of $850,000. Uh, I know the minister made an effort to try and get that for us and was unsuccessful. Similarly, the University of British Columbia sought seven plus million in the way of an additional right, level that. of assistance. Precisely what are you going to be faced with cutting so we can understand it clearly because the only thing I've really taken notice is your football team that somehow or other doesn't cause tears to course down my chubby cheeks. Well, it may not cause tears to run down your chubby cheeks, but it's causing tears to run down a lot of other people. We've had something like 140 phone calls about the dropping of football and not very much about some of the areas in, on the academic side that are being and cut you, back. Naturally, you feel unpla uncomfortable about that. How much are you going to save by cutting back in track and field and football? About $150,000. In fact, you have a good team which has done very well. Yes, to I be think quite it, fair. on the Canadian scene, our football team has probably been as successful as anybody's. What else are you going to cut? We are cutting the, ma the major part of the track program. The other major areas of cutback involve, we have a a reading and, and study center, which had in its employ seven uh, people. We are reducing that to, to a single individual who will move over into the counseling area. There's a saving there of about $150,000. We are not renewing the contracts of five lecturers in the English department. Uh, there's another $150,000. The rest of the cuts, uh, I don't think it's useful for me to go through them all here today. But to a total of? To a total of a million and a half dollars. One and a half million dollars. That's right. Will you really suffer? Now, for instance, does anyone look over your shoulder uh, from the universities, whatever you call it, and say, you've got redundant courses, get rid of them? Well, the redundancy question is a legitimate one to raise. I I'm hard-pressed personally to know where the redundancy exists, and, and I'm not trying to duck the no, question no. or the issue. But uh, if you look at um, the university system in British Columbia, of the three universities, clearly one has, has a m more mature status than the others in the sense of having a much wider and, and better balanced program. The two younger institutions clearly are, are relatively adolescent, and I'm tremendously hard-pressed personally to know where we've got redundancy. That isn't to say we might not have a small department here 
or there that it doesn't have quite the enrollment we'd like it to have. But in general, we have high demand in almost all areas. We have the highest faculty to student ratio of any of the three institutions. And frankly, I don't know where the redundancies exist. Well, you got to, your people got to, who got the 17% arbitration award? <clears throat> Uh, in our case, there was a total of 17 percent. In the case of UBC, it was 21 percent. Yeah, but who was it? Was that for your faculty? That's for our faculty. Was that too much? Well, too much. Uh, if you look at where faculty are relative to uh, other occupational groups over the years, they have fallen fairly impressively behind. Uh, too much is, is strictly a relative kind of I issue. Know that UBC I mean, it was too much for us to deal with within our budget. We had budgeted 12 percent plus the normal increments they get. In other words, 15 percent. And clearly, we had a 2% shortfall there. I know that UBC have the, the highest level of faculty salaries in Canada, I'm told. How does that say fuel rate? Uh, we will be at just about the same level. But I think you have to be a little careful when you start using those data and factor out the regional differences in cost of living and so on. If you do that, we're not an awful lot higher than the Canadian average. Mm -hmm. How many employees do you have up there, faculty and non-faculty? Uh, roughly 1,500. So your payroll must be quite immense in your 70 well, million. Yeah, in any institution like that, the payroll will constitute roughly 80 percent of your cost. So anytime you start talking about reductions of any consequence, you're talking about reducing the, the, the number of employees. So you're faced with uh, cutting your five uh, lecturers, right. I believe. You're faced with trimming back your football and your track and field and putting up fees, and you're at the end of your tether. Will the no, no, I'm not at the end of my tether, and, and uh, despite what is reported, I am not bitter about the situation. Well, you said I, that. The yes, Peterson I've, bitter I've, I've seen that two or three times. I don't know where that perception comes from. I'm obviously disappointed, and I'm anxious about my institution, that it fare well. Um, I did bring along a few visuals. I don't know whether you want to have a look at yeah, those. No, no, we'll have a look at them. I hate visuals. No, I know you do. You bring them, I'll show them, and uh, if anybody else can understand them, that's a bonus for you. And then we'll do a short segment, then we'll bring in the Minister of University Science and Technology. Fine. What kind of guy is he? He's a good guy. Is he? Yes. He should, he, should, he should get us more money, but uh, basically he's a good guy. Get lots of money for the hospital at UBC. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> commenting on that one. You can comment on that one. After you? the break. <laughs> Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of last week, I did uh, three reports on the bureaucratic confusion, the problems, the ministerial indecision involving the treatment of children with severe mental problems, often associated with delinquency and crime, and also those with diseases of the mind. And by the time I had interviewed Dr. John Duffy, the director of the Forensic Psychiatric Services Commission of British Columbia, we had established quite clearly that there's a new broom in the province and that the Maples with its 26 bed secure unit will be open and in full operation within four months. And that this particular operation of the Maples, I also told you some of the problems at the juvenile detention center, where at least 10% of the 60 odd youngsters there at any time should not be there because they're not getting the treatment they need. Uh, I particularly asked Dr. Gossett, who is the director of the child abuse team at the Royal Columbia in British Columbia and has been deeply involved as a consultant to the Ministry of Human Resources on child protection, risk factors, and all the rest of this very important subject. Do you feel easier in your mind now, Dr. Gossage, that we've finally got a decision after the psychiatrist's withdrawal of services and all that nonsense, that the Maples will be in operation shortly under the full control of the medical profession? Is that going to assist in coping with the problems arising from your particular uh, investigations and expertise in this field? I wish I could say I had confidence. Um, I hope so. Uh, but I have uh, been around this province long enough now to have a certain healthy skepticism that I'll believe it when I see it. Um, I don't think by changing brooms you necessarily solve problems. I think it's going to take a lot more than brooms. I think it's going to take attitudes. And, and I'm not sure on the basis of what I've heard I'm that the attitudes are going to change. I'm going to ask you what I asked Liz Watson and the two other lawyers the other day. As of this moment, where does British Columbia stand on a scale of 1 to 10 in its treatment of children who've come through the abuse route to mental problems or delinquency or whatever? Where do we stand on a scale of 1 to 10 now? Well, I would, I would agree with uh, my legal colleagues who were with you the other day. I think it's probably one or two, and that's perhaps being uh, flattering. Overly generous. Yes. 
What kind of problems do you face in handling this particularly troubled children who have been through some dreadful abuse experience and from there on got into further trouble? Well, the problems we face uh, relate to a real sense of knowledge of what these youngsters need, but an inability to translate that knowledge of what they need into uh, the real world of treatment uh, on an long, ongoing basis. Um, I increasingly travel the province in the work I do as a consultant, and um, I, it, it saddens me to sort of hear the, the glib answers that are, are given about what is available uh, in the province. Well, we're supposed to have a network of services. We're, we're supposed to have a network, um, but you go to uh, almost any community in this province, and you find that that network uh, uh, relates more to the attitudes of the individuals there than to the particular training skills they have. Uh, and uh, I think I was remarking to you when we were preparing for this program about two small communities in BC, very close to one another, where attitudes are tremendously different and where the capacity to deal with these problems, therefore, is different. It has nothing to do with the particular training of the people. Well, that was a point I think that Duffy was making the other day, that one of the problems in this province has been there's been a tendency to say, this child must go into the Maples. The child must go into the JDC, uh, the Youth Detention Center, when in fact we totally lack, am I correct, any kind of local examination, referral, and then a final decision for in treatment. Is that one of the problems? I, I think that's true. Um, we talk about the existence of local referral resources and that sort of thing, but when it comes down to the bottom line, I find that that's not true. And um, um, the as I say, the uh, solution seems to relate more to the formation of uh, a network of professionals who trust one another than to a mass of psychiatrists or a mass of probation officers or a mass of any Do other kind of professional. Well, I'm, I'm a little bit late in asking this question after I did the three programs last week, but do you feel that this secure unit at the Maples was essential and that we must have it for the care and treatment within t custody of certain children? Oh, yes. I, I think it such a facility is necessary. Um, I noted as I was watching the tapes of Dr. Duffy that he was uh, focusing very heavily on the definition of mental illness. Uh, I tend probably through not being a psychiatrist I can afford the luxury of being a little more freewheeling and I tend to deal more in the area of kids who are very very troubled whether by virtue of mental illness or something else more generally for a whole series of reasons and uh, I, I guess I'm worried that uh, uh, I perceive anyway that, a, that containment and treatment is necessary for more than simple mental illness. Ah, that was a message I got from Dr. Duffy. I mean, I think I'm quoting him correctly when I say that I got the feeling that uh, a concerned person on the outside, even a judge, far less a probation officer, might find it very difficult to get treatment in uh, the maples, in the cottages or in the secure unit, unless that person falls closely into the definition of a disease of the mind. Exactly. That would be bad, wouldn't it? I think it would be bad. Um, you're peeling one group off from a group that needs help. And uh, my experience in the work I do is that, in terms of the children I see, most of them have a, a number of things going on of which significant mental illness may be a part. Tell me some of the problems you face though, in the treatment of, put, I don't want any horror stories, but do you feel frustrated in following through on child abuse, for instance? How does the system work if it works at all? How widespread is child abuse? Well, I think everybody knows that child abuse is, is very widespread indeed. Uh, and um, in terms of the volume we see at the Royal Columbian Hospital, which is a, a busy child protection center now, we see about 250 new cases a year, of which uh, they distribute out uh, pretty typically according to the Canadian distribution, which is some 15%, 20% are physical abuse. We're now seeing 35 to 40% of our first contacts are sexually abused children. But the big message is that these kids come from intensely troubled backgrounds, and um, the uh, end result is that a complex network of treatment services is needed. What do you do with them just now? If you have a child from an intensely troubled background, and you, did you say 75 to 40 percent sexually abused? That's correct, yes. And this is in family abuse almost more or less, is it yes. not? Yes, 
Yes, almost all that is by a person who is known to the child. Therefore, you must take that child. Must you take that child away forthwith? Usually, almost always. Um, that is a, a judgment not made so much by myself, because uh, I do not, in the work I do, hold the authority to apprehend. Um, the, uh, quite correctly, the authority rests with the superintendent of child welfare. Uh, but we judge each case on its own merits, and there is a very skilled network of uh, persons, locally anyway, who are, I think, able to assist in the making of a wise judgment. I think where the problem lies is going from judgment, having a knowledge of the sorts of things that are needed in order to help that child and family, and finding yourself up against the stone wall of, of uh, of a lack of facilities, either because of fa lack of trained people or a bureaucracy which just won't let it work. We're going to talk more with Dr. Gossage from the Royal Columbian in New Westminster, head of the child abuse team there and the consultant of the MHR after the break. Is that going the way you want it? Yeah. The medical profession and others will be keeping a close eye on the reorganization of the BC Youth uh, Development Center, which is the Maples on Willingdon Avenue. But uh, uh, you expressed a fear, I want to put it to you again. This is now going to be under medical control with a medical director. Is that necessary? I like it because it's clean cut. Somebody at last is in charge. But is that good from your point of view? I don't think that the medical profession uh, always has to be uh, the, in the driver's seat. I think that what is important here is that there is a line of authority. Um, if, as Dr. Duffy says, this is going to be strictly related to mental illness, then I support the concept of a medical person in control. I guess my concern is, as I've indicated, that uh, the kinds of problems we're dealing with are only partly mental health ones. and. Um, I guess I'm fearing that one small segment is going to be broken off in terms of the helping of these youngsters and leave a whole mass of troubled kids out there. Yeah, well, see, Dr. Duffy's attitude, and he is, of course, I suppose, a classic, it takes a classic psychiatric approach, is that you can't treat adolescents and that uh, a child or a youngster will himself decide at what time he's going to go straight. Mm -hmm. And that perhaps some of the best things a child in trouble can do is to run, to get away from mm -hmm. that environment. Is he right or wrong in that? Well, if you can't treat adolescents, then I'm wasting a lot of my personal time. I do believe you can treat adolescents, um, or you can assist adolescents to treat themselves. I, I do not take a cynical view that you can't treat What kind of problems are we talking about in the adolescents that you're uh, dealing with? From the time kinds of adolescents I'm dealing with are those who probably would not fall in the definition of mental ill health, uh, but they are youngsters uh, who by reasons of a combination of background and the environment they're moving in and some of their own ill-advised decisions uh, have got themselves into difficulty, whether it be with drugs, alcohol, uh, criminality, this sort of thing. And many of the things that your panel of lawyers were dealing with the Does other day. Does child abuse lead to delinquency in that child? I certainly believe that there is every evidence that uh, chronic emotional deprivation, child abuse, does contribute to delinquent behavior later on. I think there are many good studies on this, and uh, the Senate report from the federal government, which you may be familiar with, has, has certainly addressed that and made it very clear. You call it chronic emotional deprivation. Yes. If a child has been sexually abused at home or beaten about at home, this leads to great trouble in their minds. It certainly can. And into delinquency. It certainly can. Now, in your child abuse team in the Royal Columbian, do you have sufficient resources to handle some of these troubled youngsters within your system? I would have to say only partly. Um, our team functions basically voluntarily uh, and functions within the normal confines of a hospital unit. Um, it requires uh, to do a really thorough job, far, far more um, time on the part of the professionals than they have. In other words, you get the child when the child becomes an instant casualty. Yes. You get the child as a casualty. We're dealing in crisis intervention, and uh, we know enough about 
families at risk now that we would love to be able to get in earlier and uh, get into the more preventive side of things. But how can you prevent that? If a family hasn't had its explosion and nobody has put the child's hands on a burning stove or abused it sexually, you can't act until you intervene in the crisis. That's true, but we now know enough about families at risk and a sufficiently high percentage of these are known to social agencies, whether they're known to the Ministry of Human Resources or the police or whatever, that I think that there is every evidence that, we, that those working in this field could get in much earlier and but prevent some of these catastrophes that make the headlines. But is it, it must be a very brave next door family which knows of abuse or sexual abuse or physical abuse who's going to call the authorities? Uh, I would have said that three or four years ago, but you are well aware that uh, the media and the public are much better informed now about the issue of child abuse. They are much better informed about the mandatory reporting that all of us as citizens are required to undertake. And I think that I have seen a change in that. I've seen a change in the willingness of, of persons to report. Uh, the helpline for children, which was a... That's a good thing. I think it's a very good thing. Um, basically, uh, I have said before, and I'll say again, I, I think uh, the minister opened a Pandora's box when she established that helpline and basically uh, put in a marvelous storefront, but uh, the problem is that the storefront doesn't match the, uh, the availability of services on the inside. You can get the calls, but you can't cope with the consequences. That's right. More with Dr. Gossage and your calls, too, after the break. But uh, the reorganization of the Maples has got to be a step in the right direction, surely. Oh, I think it's a step in the right direction. Uh, I hope it is not conceived, though, as an instant solution to a problem that has long standing. I, I see it as a part of the solution, but just a part. And I, I will be very surprised if the staffing is at the point he said it was going to be, at the time he said it's going to be. I he, hope you will do your six I'll months uh, review. He's got 75 people to hire. He says he's already got lines on people, and he's going to have it going in two months, full operation in four months, and I can walk in any time after six months. Well, I hope you will. Oh, uh, some I of will. us would like to go along with you. <laughs> might be a good idea to take a doctor with me so that I'm not conned. Not that I'm suggesting anyone would <laughs> call me. Go ahead from Cam Loops, please. Yeah, Doctor, I'd like to direct a question to Dr. Gossard. I'm a clergyman, and uh, it, it's frustrating for me when I see a family with a potential situation. There's nothing happened, or, or there's not a lot of abuse going on, but I, I've turned to both M M MHR and RCMP, and uh, it's frustrating when absolutely nothing happens. There's no help. Nobody's interested in... Uh, in giving help, where do I turn? It's like a broken record, isn't it? Um, I, I am most sympathetic with you. Um, I think that we have tended to underestimate the value of the family doctor in cases like this. Um, family doctors are interested and are in a position to deal in what is perceived as a situation of confidence with the families. Uh, they in a sense are not institutionalized and I think they are in a, in a able to approach these difficult matters uh, in a sense of confidence with the family that a person who is regarded as part of Big Brother is not able to do so and I really feel that we have tended to underutilize but family But the clergyman doctors. could go to the family's doctor and say please I'm concerned about this family would you have a look at it? I, I think that uh, either going directly from the family saying you should see your family doctor or if he knows them calling them I, I really think we underutilize family doctors in terms of this way. Well anything else Minister? No that's a good answer to my question. Thank, Thank you. you. Go ahead please. Yes, good morning, Jack. I've been in uh, the field of mental health and child care for 25 years, and I came to British Columbia in 74, and the situation here has been very concerning. Uh, number one, um, I think Maples is a necessary facility for the flagrantly ir incorrigible youngster. But my question, and I agree with Dr. Cossage this morning, is what happens to the child that we see in the schools the uh, local hospital situations, the homes, etc., that don't fall within the Mental Health Act. They can't fit into this category. And 
prevention, as far as I'm concerned, is the big thing that we should be looking at around here. I think our priorities are really mixed up. I work in the penitentiary system, and I think we spend millions of dollars on that, and we spend very little on children or senior citizens. Okay, hold it there, Dr. Gossage. Um, I agree with you, caller, and uh, I, I suppose uh, with advancing years I'm becoming cynical, uh, but uh, I really do not think children ha have a high priority politically, and uh, uh, so long as they don't have a high priority politically, uh, so long as, say, Northeast Coal is, is, takes vast precedence over kids, uh, I think we're going to continue to have this kind of infighting and this kind of divide and conquer mentality. Uh, I don't pretend to know what, what the solution is, but until uh, professionals can stop fighting one another and, uh, and until s government can make a basic decision that children are of some importance, I, I fear that we are going to continue to have the same problems. It's that bad, you feel, that our priorities for children after all these years and all these millions of dollars spent are still low. Well, they, they don't become a high issue until you have an Olson case. Uh, and by the way, it infuriated me to read that he's got three psychiatrists available for him. But that's another topic. Go ahead from the Nanaimo, please. Hello. Yes. Jack Webster. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I see your finger on the button, but I, I've been trying to get on your program for about three weeks. Make your point. Yeah. I just weighed three and three quarter pounds my first year as a Scotchman, born, conceived in Edinburgh. And oh, born in I'm Winnipeg. delighted to know where you were conceived. That makes my day, precisely, yeah. and I'm grateful for your call. Now, either come to the point of... Okay. I'm from Nanaimo. And I was at the bottom of the barrel as an alcoholic. Well, I have every... And a chain smoker. I'm 71. I am not an alcoholic. I am a I chain smoker. You were. I, didn't I wish you the smoker. very best of luck, sir, yeah. in your endeavors for your fruitful and productive life. How can I get on where he was conceived? None of my business. I'm not a peak freak. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'm just wondering. Uh, I know of a certain incident here where. There's been a child, what I feel is, uh, is been very neglected. I think she's about eight years old, this little one is. That's a little bit too, too young to be left uh, at home alone and so on while the mother is out carousing and uh, drinking and all the rest of it. What, what is the legal age that a child can be left at home? I am sorry, I should be able to answer that question. I can't, but I, I know what is very clear, and that is if you, as a citizen, have reason to believe that a child is being abused or neglected or is in need of protection, the Family and Child Services Act makes it absolutely clear that you have a requirement in law to report. They will, the Ministry of Human Resources will then investigate and decide on the validity or otherwise, but you have a requirement in a law, and in, fact, and in fact, penalties exist for failure to report. Well, I don't see how I would be subject to that because nobody knows that I even know but it looks absolutely ridiculous yeah. to have you know anyone any any kid who can't uh, who can't cope with being alone type of thing well it's up to you to phone the helpline at least can he phone I'm, the helpline? surely surely or his local ministry of human resources yes office. when uh, are you going to be placing numbers like that in the air as the show uh, no I just phone up MHR right? who's that Ministry of Human Resources. I see. And, and they're you the ones who take these complaints. If you That's can't correct. find it, phone us back. We'll get the number for you. Oh, I'm sure I'll get it with our telephone book system. Thank you. Bye. I think it's worth the trouble. Dr. Gussies, I'm gra grateful you came along this morning. A little disturbed. 250 cases a year in New Westminster alone? No. Uh, 250 ca cases per year are referred to the Royal Columbian Unit. Uh, you're aware that we sit smack in the middle of the biggest population of kids in B.C., and uh, we are a referral unit, so they come from all over the place. We'll be following this topic in detail. My thanks to Dr. Gossage, the pediatrician, head of the child abuse team at our Royal Columbia. I'll be back after the break. Canada's top postie, Michael Warren, tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely.